I've started taping. Okay, good. Good morning, everyone. And thanks to those people who've um, come back to the presentation. Unfortunately, as you know, we had a technical problem last week, which we think we've sorted out. So, so welcome back. I just want to quickly reintroduce Gerard Mankies for those of you who are perhaps new to the show and, and, and don't know about him. Gerard obtained his um, honors degree in geochemistry in 1984 at the University of Orange Free State and then subsequent, subsequently did an MSc and a PhD at, at, at the universe, same university. Um, both of these studies were on the Plattberg Group Volcanics of the Fentersdorp Supergroup. He, he worked as an exploration geologist for Angler Vol. He's lectured at the University of Stellenbosch. Um, he, he did another stint with gold fields uh, in, on gold exploration in 1995 to 1998. And thereafter, like many of us, he set up his own business and created a geological consulting company, which he eventually sold. Um, he's had a long association with Namaqualand and probably knows more about the, the base metals of that area and region than most. And so we're looking forward to his successful presentation this morning. Thanks, Gerard. Um, good luck, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, John, and good morning to everyone. Um, I would like to thank John and, and Henny to make this happen and uh, to put up with the problems we had last week. I would like to apologize for that. But I think um, <clears throat> hopefully we have bypassed that today. Uh, yes, John asked me to talk about the base metals in the Northern Cape. And we will look at an overview, um, sorry, uh, overview of the geology of that uh, so-called Namakwa sector sector of the Namakwa Natal Metamorphic Province. Look at some of the base metal deposits and the uh, potential to find more in the area. And I hope to stimulate some debate on the geological model of the Namakwa sector and the exploration uh, potential of the area. Just want to make clear that uh, this presentation is purely based on public information um, in the public domain. I didn't uh, uh, intentionally put any uh, proprietary information in, in this presentation. Also, uh, as far as possible, try to um, avoid putting personal opinions or, or, or my personal opinions and interpretations in. There's been uh, a lot of uh, research and publications from the Northern Cape through the years, and uh, some excellent work uh, came out and is still being produced. Uh, the information and and data um, is still forthcoming and, and uh, the interpretations is being refined all the time. And I would like to give credit to all those geologists that, that has shared that with us. Specifically, three individuals really helped to open my mind about uh, on the geology of the Northern Cape. Uh, one is Lowe from Skullbreak, uh, who is with Ryan at the moment. The other is Leon from Mark, specifically on the Okip proper district. And then Hanu Arman is, uh, is a lateral thinker when it comes to exploration. Thank you for that. Um, the uh, uh, presentation will be based on this index here. Um, we will look at the regional geological framework, the base metal deposits and occurrences in the area and what types they are. Um, look at the DMS model, and now it fits in with the tectonic model for the area. And briefly look at the nickel sulfide deposits and occurrences, and uh, think a little bit about where we are on the exploration of the Northern Cape and, and what is the potential and, and the future will look like. Um, just note that specifically I excluded other metals and minerals, the Northern Cape's quite rich on other metals as well. Uh, but that's maybe a different uh, scenario. And also I've restricted the discussion to the South African territory. It, of course, uh, the micro belt continues into Namibia, but it, that adds a bit of a different dimension to it. So in the micro uh, province, you're probably quite familiar with the, the bright pink or the outcrop areas so-called Namakwa sector in the Northern Cape. And of course, there's also some outcrops in Natal and deep cover under Karui and the South 
and then it continues into Namibia. The area is subdivided into different sub-provinces and terrains. Um, this is from Abram Rosendahl's paper of 2017, which really is just based on the work of Thomas and other authors in 1994. Um, so we look at the Bushmanland sub-province, and I like to divide it in sort of a western uh, area and an eastern area, like in, in, in yellow here. The Gorgonia sub-province, which the rest um, call the Kalkamas terrain, then the Ariaga terrain, which is all in the news now with the Ryan Mingles. To the east of that, the Kain terrain, which is older, and then the Kais province, east of that, which is older still. And of course, east of that is the Kabul Kraton. The Richtersveld sub-province is also somewhat older than the Bushmanland province uh, up here. And um, then, of course, younger Haribdal to the west. Um, just remember, I've cut it off uh, the presentation to it to the South African border here. The base metal deposits and occurrences in the area can be divided into active mines. Um, Closed mines, which I prefer to call closed mines, um, because they're not by any means mined out, they're typically closed from the 90s onwards. Then deposits, uh, some of them have some resources in the past, maybe not uh, compliant to either of any of the codes, but nevertheless. And some were previously mined on small scale as well, and then of course, in numerous occurrences. Let's have a look at that. If we look uh, at active mines, it's really just the mines at Achenais, all owned by the Dante at the moment. Some are closing down or has closed down, uh, and some need, needs deepening. So it's really all about, uh, largely about Hansberg at the moment, which is uh, um, mining huge tonnages per year. Um, just note also that the Namapa province is disappearing under. Karu, uh, uh, initially on the thin Karu cover here to the south, thickening uh, further, of course, to the south, and also young cover to the north. Um, so it, it, it continues under that cover. And of course, the Kabul Kraton sitting out in the east. Now, that's what Hansberg looks like now when you zoom past on the, on the highway uh, or on the, on the main road there. Um, and the entrance to the mine. The, what I call the closed mines are Prisco mine out at the bottom of the Arauha belt. Um, we tend to talk about Copperton, but Copperton is the mine village name and the mine's name was Prisco mine. And the Ryan Minnells is trying hard and at the point of reopening that mine, being fully permitted, permitted and licensed to reopen the mine. Out west, uh, the mines in the Kokip Copper Belt, uh, still also some of them has got uh, plenty of resources and the area is highly prospective for further resources. And there's various companies there trying to, uh, to restart that as well. Um, Ryan, um, as he cleared, that's the view from the top. Uh, Ryan has, um, Declared a uh, resource of about 30 million tons, most of which on the underground. And they've reopened the main uh, uh, decline. Uh, it was uh, blocked off uh, when Anglovar closed the mine in 91. And uh, hopefully they know where we are when we're standing there, but we did come out okay. Um, yeah, there's even ore that was mined and lying there, you can all it out in the mine that restarts. Uh, I just want to mention on the previous slide, there's also further potential for resources underground, which they will drill once the, the mine has been dewatered. Uh, it's just cheaper to, to look at those extensions. So we will see that 30 million tons might be increased somewhat. Out on the, on the uh, O'Keep side, also amazing good ground conditions still underground, similar to Prisca. Some of them still has resources and the area has got plenty of potential. Even some of the 
historic open cast areas. This uh, we're looking at the whole ore zone here uh, that that continues and that was was not mined with uh, some spectacular boronite and uh, other proper mineralization by malachite. Um, if we look at the base metal of Occurrences and, and deposits, um, withdrawals. Uh, remember, it's public information and it's by no means complete. Um, one can see this uh, concentration uh, of deposits that saw a few drawals on the Yaraha belt, uh, especially down here in the Kiska mine area. And there's also a cluster sort of offset from Yaraha um, down at the extension of the Kain Terrain. Or supposedly so. If we look um, in the in the outcrop in the, the field, one can often find the the hollow positions, and sometimes the boreal locks can be traced. Um, usually, without a lot of detail, summary lock kind of things uh, or data, and and unfortunately, not always with detail assay data. But nevertheless, it gives a good idea what what why it was brought. And then numerous uh, base metal occurrences uh, without drill holes. And again, remember some of them might have, uh, I'm not aware, but one can see there's no preference for a specific terrain. Um, the occurrences in the kind terrain are probably uh, over trusted um, sheet of the Ariaga belt. So the time tend to be fairly dry. Uh, it doesn't look too perspective and the ties, the oldest of these terrains, the ties are, are uh, looks pretty dry. Um, I want to mention that the the the, the um, length of this uh, this whole area is about 600 kilometers by about 250 kilometers. So it's a fair sizable terrain we're looking at. We can classify uh, the deposits as far as we can with the data that's available into magmatic, uh, volcanic mass of sulfide and sedimentary exoderative uh, deposits. Um, and most, of course, lack sufficient data to, to know what they are. So, of, of course, the uh, keep uh, copper district, those deposits, and there's plenty more uh, than I only showed the mine positions. Uh, are all magmatic related. The nickel sulfides, Yaku main spun area here, and some of the others that we know enough about uh, are also magmatic related. But not all of the nickel uh, is, is associated with that. Some of the DMSs um, can also carry a little bit of nickel, um, but I don't have much information on that. What's officially recognized as volcanic mass of sulfides, again concentrated on the Ariaga belt here in the east, um, but also towards, towards the west. And we will look at that in, a, in the next slide uh, or in a moment. Uh, there's only two CEDICs uh, that classify CEDICs uh, because one can uh, distinguish between uh, VMS and CEDICs uh, by looking at the proper lead zinc ratio. And it's only Black Mountain and uh, Broken Hill and the Deeps that are considered to be um, CEDEX according to this diagram. In gray um, are the constant of uh, numerous occurrences throughout the world and the cluster uh, of, 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 of on the seat in the CEDEX field here. VM is field here and also mainly up here. So we can see on the legend here which uh, sufficient information to, to be classified. And contrary to a popular uh, um, belief, the, the Homsberg and, and Big Sint line also are the types of, of VMS deposits, and so it's Salt River. Um, this field of the volcanic massive sulfides are also uh, sort of called the Piroco type deposits or Broken Hill, Broken Hill Australia type of type deposits. Yes, and then uh, we've got little information on most of the other occurrences uh, to, to see where they fit in and what does that mean. You're all familiar with uh, the model for a volcanic mass of sulfides. Um, it's very simple, the diagram. I just want to point out 
that your economic um, or can be in the, in the red zone, in the stock work. It can be at the base of the black smoker complex, or it could have formed on, on um, the surface of the ocean at that stage or the sea floor. Or there could be economic or on any of these three. So, so uh, exploration uh, and, and drilling campaign must take that into consideration, which can be challenging in a, in a tectonic area like the Northern Cape. They're quite spectacular and form uh, uh, dramatic um, pixelations on the seafloor. Um, and when they were discovered, it was it was quite a revelation. I'm not sure when I got this photo and where it was from, but I believe it was um, uh, it's of a deposit in Japan when a hill had a, um, a cutting to a hill for a high-speed railway exposed the whole VMS depository, which was a bit unexpected. Uh, I think this one is in, in Spain. Um, most of these deposits being in the, in, in, uh, associated with the subduction has been deformed to some extent. This is the mass of sulfides probably uh, that formed on the, on the sea floor. And, uh, uh, stock work uh, below that is probably uh, largely overturned here. Brief look at where BMSs occur. Um, according to the USGS, um, paper on that, special paper, they form a back arc basins in, a, in a oceanic uh, terrain associated with island arcs and subduction. They can form in most ocean ridges and they also formed in back arc basins associated with subduction on the continental edge. And not normally forming on the arc, uh, continental margin arc associated with this type of uh, subduction. And here is uh, deposits that's rich in zinc, um, like Frisco are typically form, uh, formed in the continental back arc basins, not so much in the oceanic uh, back arc basins. So how does it fit into what we see in the Northern Cape? Uh, as pointed out, Ariaga belt is, uh, is rich in VMSs. And uh, so let's look at a tectonic model um, or models for this terrain here in the, in the Eastern part of the Namakwa sector. This is the model that works for Orion minerals, uh, subduction, volcanic island arc, Ocean floor with BMS is forming on the arc and on the floor. This is uh, coast terrain on the edge of, of the Tarbol Craton and the areas underlined by tectonic material. As subduction goes on, it gets deformed. Later, mafic infusions can bring uh, nickel mineralization. Um, I see that I don't have the, the, the tectonic material underlying this terrain anymore. I'm not sure. Why? And then later on, you have your, your, your later protons of, of typical genetic material, including further deforming the area. So this is, this is generally the style of, of model that everyone uh, has got with a few variations. This is Bailey. Uh, again, island arc, uh, back arc basin underlined by, by protonic material and the ties and then later deformation. For Nell and Peterson, 2007, largely similar. Uh, also, Ariaga being a volcanic arc. Ties with rifting, uh, initially, Tarbol Craton. Uh, Tarkamas ter terrain being a pre existing terrain being abducted. And then Bushmanland as well. And with that collision, you have uh, uh, thrusting of some of this material onto the tarball craton, so there's a wedge of tarball under it. Um, 2013, largely they still have the same, same model for the area. So how to explain uh, some of the BMS is sitting out the west. Um, well, Osborn in his master's 2011 has got the Ariaga already abducted to the Tyson tarball. Subduction 
different subduction that have happening to the west, uh, forming an island arc and the salt river deposit. Van uh, Kerk last week in the pre publication, um, again, Ariaga of Island Arc, uh, back arc basin without a cryptonic uh, material underlying it. And then we have what Kraton riding on, etc., forming the Kalkamas and, and Richterswell provinces and that later deformation. Um, so let's have a look at, at what does it mean. Um, I put this slide in on uh, John and Henny's uh, uh, suggestion that I spice it up a little bit yesterday, or that's my version of it. Um, so blame them, I'm exposing my ignorance now. Um, if we look at the Ariahop uh, terrain, if that was the orientation of the rifting spreading, and you had the conveyor belt the subduction uh, coming from this direction um, with a with a uh, with a cratonic uh, uh, volcanic arc uh, next to the rifting, um, there's definitely a lighter component. Uh, I mean, widely reported that that is lighter compression from a slightly different direction, uh, deforming everything at a lighter stage. Um, and then, of course, strike slip um, uh, tectonics as well. Um, I'm not sure how that fits in with the Riftersfeld province. Um, and, and the indication I have is that some of the authors may suggest uh, subduction and, and the conveyor belt coming from a different direction. The point I'm getting at um, is if one look at the nickel sulfide. Uh, bodies or some of them like Yakumain Spun, which actually consists of, of various bodies. Um, the deformation of those bodies seems to be lighter and to be less, uh, a lower degree of metamorphism than the country rock. So it would be interesting to understand where that fits in at what stage and at what stage of the tectonic evolution of the area. Brief look at the nickel sulfide deposits. Uh, Yaku main spun is the well known one with a lot of uh, exploration work done on it. It's one of the few discoveries in the Northern Cape uh, by geophysics um, from scratch. Most of the others, like Frisco and so on, was known uh, long before geophysics came around. Yes, geophysics for sure uh, enhanced the, the uh, prospect prospecting efforts to find extensions and, and determine the size of a lot of these deposits. But your physics uh, was an early stage, in a very early stage when, for instance, Prisco was, was um, fully discovered and even your, your command spun was discovered. Um, the geophysics that we see today is, is quite a different story. And I think we, we can apply that to great success for instance, for nickel sulfides in the area. Most of the nickel sulfide occurrences uh, has got very little information and uh, they seem to be associated, uh, well, from a tectonic model, it makes sense, with the BME centers. Um, and this, apart from that, numerous other mafic and ultramafic uh, intrusive bodies, uh, large bodies of anorthosetic uh, material as well. And they don't seem to be restricted to a specific terrain and the genetic relationship and, and, and age relationship is, is, is not well known at this moment. I um, want to point out even in the adjacent terrains, the older terrains, there's also a, a lot of these, these increases. Um, we see Yaku main span area here further nickel uh, showings in the, in the area of our belt. As mentioned, um, maybe this in, in the kind of terrain is just area of sitting there. And there's also further ones out west, probably associated with, with BMSs. Um, that is a plot of the BMSs we looked at earlier and said it's, um, some of these have nickel mineralization um, associated with them uh, very intimately, so it doesn't really show up on this on this slide. But 
where we see nickel occurrences and don't know about uh, copper mineralization, is in copper mineralization, maybe there's potential for that as well. Sometimes one uh, by chance came across um, very um, interesting borals, such as this one um, in the surrounding terrain. Uh, company was looking for something else, drilled through a, a, a mafic autoperoxinetic auto uh, intrusive for hundreds of meters, stopped the boral. Afterwards, sample sent for for uh, petrographic analysis uh, and more, and um, then turned out to have lots of sulfites in in uh, layering in this in this uh, sequence. Um, although the boral locks uh, says there's there's nothing there's no sulfide mineralization, um, it's really very exciting to see a boral like this. And when one looks further, sort of regional borals on a very wide spacing in the area of a, a large, a huge area seems to have intersected similar, similar intrusive materials. So I think a lot of that has been overlooked and ignored in the past. And uh, there's definitely perspectivity for that in the Western Carbol Crack on and on Northern Cape. So we are we? Um, I think the Keep Copper District is well understood. Uh, I hope the rain, especially as far as rain is concerned, I think they make very good um, work in understanding that. Um, but we don't have a, a uniform tectonic model for the area. There's this uh, small differences between the, the, the existing uh, tectonic models, but certainly it needs refinement. We need more data on a lot of these deposits and occurrences to make more sense out of it. Um, the genetic model uh, and classification, we can only do when we have more data. And of course, um, the nickel sulfide mineralization, um, I think is largely um, un un not, not well understood yet. So we, that needs a lot of attention. And it comes down to what I call the East Bushmanland uh, 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 sub province and the Kalkamas terrains, especially, I think, um, can, can deliver much more for us if we understand it better. Um, maybe the tectonic model um, could be a bit more complex and, and uh, it will only come forth with more refinement of it. Area is certainly underexplored. Um, the geophysics have, have made great strides since the 90s. And before that, base metal prices were depressed for many decades. Big changes in South Africa and lots of attention on the bushveld where all the uh, opportunities were, etc. Northern Cape largely uh, on the back burner. Um, and Although there has been some activity, not with great efforts, I think, uh, with proper funding, and geophysics can make that difference. Um, so chemistry nowadays as well also is a great aid in understanding your, your stratigraphy and your mineralization and, and your uh, genesis of your ore deposits better. Um, and that all fits in with the huge stride in understanding and, and knowledge about uh, Volcanic massive sulfides, silicates, and, and nickel sulfide deposits. I mean, these uh, were only discovered um, via um, in, in, in 1979, uh, which is a great gift to us when I was a student because any test and uh, exam would have a 10 point or a 20 point. Or so you, once you've got that in your head, you, you don't have to look at that again. If one look at the Ariaga belt, um, Ryan took up uh, a, a, a large chunk of it, but there's uh, other companies also with, uh, with properties there. But apart from that, it's also disappearing on the shallow cover to the north and south. Um, so there's, there's uh, opportunity. And then this whole terrain uh, to the west towards uh, Okip, I think, um, has also needs to get much more attention. On the previous slide, I just want to mention um, that most of these deposits appear to be 
uh, somewhat older than the Ariachov deposits. And the nickel sulfide deposits that we see out here, like the Yakumain's pond mite, has probably got a genetic relationship with the Ophid copper district. And they, both of these areas, this is the youngest, uh, supposedly the youngest mineralization in the area. There's actually been quite a bit of interest in it and, and uh, taking up of ground since uh, about 2006 in the area. Uh, majors as well, juniors and private companies. Some of the majors um, actually took up large blocks of, of a million acres um, about, and, and they held it for, for many years. But to the best of my knowledge, not much activity took place. Um, and at the moment, there's, there's a lot of existing prospecting rights and, and certainly a lot of applications and pending applications. Um, so one wonder what, what happened? Why, why was there so little uh, progress? Um, as far as exploration is concerned, in the public domain, um, with detail, I mean, it's Ryan has, has really made, made a good, uh, good work of it to move forward. And uh, one must debate and, and think and philosophize about what, what is the problem. Uh, we tend to blame it on, on, uh, on BMR and politics and, you know, the uh, situation. In, in, with politics in, in the country, but I'm not sure if that is actually uh, the main cause. I think we must really work on, on changing how we, how we see uh, exploration in the country. The area has certainly got a lot of potential. I mean, we looked at, at Prisca mine, uh, apart from the mine itself and the resources left, um, the area surrounding, immediately surrounding it, it's all in uh, Ryan's press leases. Uh, okay, copper district, um, you can look at, at um, Ship Copper's um, a website and what, what they're doing there. Um, there. There's great potential. And one must keep in mind that the area did deliver giant deposits. The, the Okip area um, might be combined. If one look at it, it's a, it's a major copper district. Uh, Black Mountain and the rest of the Achenais cluster is also well over 100 million tons. Hansberg on its own is huge. Priska, uh, what Anglewald declared 47 million tons, Orion 30 million. Um, there's a chunk that's been cut off by a fault, maybe it's still sitting out there. Then you have 100 million tons as well. Yakumain spun, uh, Anglo declared 115 million tons. Anglovol reckoned not officially, uh, not, a, not a resource statement, but I thought I could add another uh, as much again to, to it on the strike distance. Uh, that takes you over 200 million tons. Yes, very low grade, but if you can be the sweetener, the Indian business. We know Southern Africa is elephant country, so uh, I'm sure Northern Cape is part of all that, uh, as we've just discussed. And uh, one must just uh, not be, be trampled. I've seen so many juniors only for the knee and, and then, uh, then get the beast angry and, and uh, get killed in the process. Um, or even if we, we climb up, take a few steps back. Uh, otherwise, if we kill the thing, it will still and you can all be there. I'm sure there's something out there. I mean, it was in the skies, that's uh, on our water. And even the rainbow indicated how the water is just over the hill there. And uh, I think we must go and have a look, proper look there. I thank you. This is my, my story for the day. Thanks, Kerat. Um, I must say your sound worked very well today. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear that. <laughs> Kerat, if I can just ask you for the non-geologist, if you could just quickly run us through ZX, VMS and VHMS so that the people can uh, understand that the one or two guys that are not geologists. Really, uh, uh, you're exposing my ignorance now. Um, it's changed a little bit since I was a student. I had to discover it, you know, so I'm not... Uh, no, just sedimentary exhalative uh, deposits, just so that the, they don't yeah, have to go and ask. 
the, well, the just what, it, what, what the acronym stands for, that's all. Yeah, uh, volcanic massive sulfides are the so-called black smokers at the seafloor, where there's a huge source of magma, driving a, a system where hot water gets circulated, pick up metals from seawater and maybe country rocks, and then it emanates as the superheated water with all these dissolved sulfides then uh, raining out as it cools. Um, Sedexes are supposedly uh, cooler systems, um, further away and, and uh, is, is more exhilarative than a, than a smoker uh, on the seafloor. Um, it's not only that they flow out and form on top of the seafloor, but as I showed and, 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 and said in that uh, a simple model of the BMS, it also can form subsurface. So the metal context of Cedexes are usually, uh, as you could see on the diagram, higher in lead, and the uh, the BMS deposits are higher in zinc and copper. Okay. The HMS. The VH, uh, VMS is volcanic massive sulfide, and Cedex is sedimentary exhilarative. But the VH, the H in in, in VMS. You get VMS and VHMS. Uh, any, um, I'll, 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 I can't recall exactly now. VHMS, um, you expose my ignorance. No, no, sorry. I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm myself. I've not been talking about this for a long time. So I just thought, you know, ask the guys, anybody else out, out there? What? Okay, what, what, what we'll do is we'll circulate the presentation to everyone and maybe Gerard can just add a covering, you know, one page to, to define them and, and explain them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good points, thank you. All right, let's, let's have some discussion. And, and Gerard, just let, let me kick it off. Um, um, my, my first question, there's obviously, you know, a lot of old work being done and that would have been what soil sampling and maybe a little bit of old, um, geophysics. And, and I mean, you talk about needing more work done, what, what sort of work should be done to really pull this, the, or these terrains apart and, you know, see what potentially is there for the future. John. I think if one look at, and, and, and I'm talking on a correction, but that's when I, what I pick up from Ryan's uh, uh, press releases and so on. I mean, what is the, what is the success recipe? Uh, recipe? Um, you, you, you have to do diligent geological work. Uh, have geologists that can unravel the stereography. They seem to be very successful in defining the horizon or horizons in the stereography of the original spreading seafloor um, on which the VMS is formed. Uh, so you must, you must understand your geology, your stratigraphy, you must do good uh, surface, detailed surface mapping. Soil sampling seems to be a, still an, an eight, although uh, a lot of projects can see soil sampling being ignored. And then of course, your physics uh, add the, the, the the dimension to see what's underground and, and, then and high resolution geophysics I, yeah. you know, modern high resolution yeah. Yeah. but to, to know more about these deposits i mean some of them are just showings we don't really know much about them i think uh, so mm -hmm. where these borals geochemistry can do a lot to understand what you have in that ball and where you are in the sequence um, and one need to from an academic point of view start tackling all these things all these showings uh, and occurrences from uh, from one side to the other. Um, because if you uh, exploration company, you can't do anything unless you've got the prospecting right. Yeah. 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 As, and as we were talking yesterday, you know, in the, in the past, we've seen, been so blanket on the Vitz gold and the Bushveld complex and Kimberlites, you know, terrains like this have really been ignored, you know, so they haven't, um, they haven't really had the modern um, technology and exploration methods thrown at them as they should. Um, okay, questions out there. See, there's some interesting names on the talk. Now the H stands for hosted, volcanic hosted massive sulfides. Oh, there we go. Thanks, John. So, so, so. 
There, there, there's oh, an expert geologist. Jamie Jane, go. Okay. Um, I, I worked on Humsburg and Black Mountain for 10 years doing rock mechanics, not, not as a geologist. But I but basically it seems everything seems to be structurally controlled. Um the the the, the, the all layers are always associated with a magnetite and do seem to be in a particular, one particular sedimentary layer. But due to the metamorphism and the folding, um, it, it's in a series of lobes. The deep mine was only found as a off chance when the broken hill mine was considered to be worked out and one or two boreholes deeper suddenly discovered a whole second lobe of, of, uh, of the ore below. And Kamsberg is very similar. And my question is, the only reason these any of these deposits has been discovered is because they outcrop on surface. And obviously, for instance, if there wasn't a broken hill, nobody would have ever discovered the deeps mine at, at Black Mountain. Um, <clears throat> because it, it's, it starts about, a, a, about 800 meters below surface. That's obviously a, a possible target for geophysical uh, exploration but is the other th thing the other e aspect that I, I consider possible is that some sort of um, computer neural network type analysis of the structure to a much greater degree than is currently done could, could actually produce um, results because every time I went up to Achimais I used to stare at all the hills around and think, nobody knows what's underneath these hills because it's just, it may be only covered about 200 meters of rock, but there could be a third or fourth of Rumsberg out there. That was all I had to say. Good. Okay. I mean, John Blaine, you've worked in that area as well. So, do you know, could, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, uh, I didn't have a lot of detailed ex uh, experience in around uh, um, that area of, of Namakoland. But I mean, through my association with Falconbridge, I did visit and spend quite a lot of time in Ontario in the uh, around Kid Creek and in, in Western Quebec around Miranda, where there are the classic VMS deposits uh, around Miranda. Um, and they're extremely well written up and very well understood even though they are of Archean age, they're very well preserved. But as you go west from Naranda to, towards Timmins to Kid Creek, you have the largest copper zinc massive sulfide on earth uh, at Kid Creek, which is intensely deformed. And uh, they're still able to recognize the, the constituent components of the classic VMS system. Uh, it around, in those areas, of course, uh, you have the benefits of glaciation and superb exposure if you can get past the the the, first, the snow and the mosquitoes in summer it's a very worthwhile area to visit and uh, going on to the, the the benefits of using something like a neural network or some sort of combined uh, study uh, bringing in every, all the information i mean that just talks back to the problem we have in southern africa or in south africa of the, the existence of databases which are hidden and lost now. And a lot of work has been done in Canada, as you know, around Sudbury and, and in the in the Naranda terrain to bring in all the work done by everybody in those areas uh, into these large databases that can virtually be walked through in three-dimensional space. And that they do definitely around Sudbury. You can almost work, walk into a room and, and look at all the drill holes that exist and all the geophysical targets that have been drilled and laid down. And I mean, if that, if nothing else is ever done in South Africa, if somehow that information can be dragged by the well, some central organisation from all the company. Uh, storage and put into a system like that, it's a monumental task, first of all, to identify it, but then uh, funding to put it together. But definitely in a place like the Macmillan, where there certainly was an awful lot of activity in, in the 70s and 80s going through into the 90s, there's got to be targets left out there that will come out of that sort of massive compilation. Otherwise, everybody is just doing everything from scratch again. And I think the 
the, the effort and the money would be far better used, in fact, recovering all that information and compiling it, much as was done for the Central Rand Goldfield on the Detroitus Run. And uh, so that's a huge exercise for a lot of people. Yeah, great, yeah, great point, John. I couldn't agree more with you. And, and we have a real life example at the moment with Anglo having left the country and, you know, offering all its data to whoever wants it. And there really should be a, a major initiative to get that into a central repository and, and have it managed so that, you know, everyone can use it. I mean, that's just a treasure trove of info. Thank you. Stefan Dolskov, uh, you, you wanted to ask a yeah. question? Yeah. Thank you. Well, to, carrying on from what John was saying about Namakoland, I spent much of it 2018 um, there with a company that's um, relooking at a couple of deposits uh, near Nubabib. And um, I can, it's quite heartening news to know that there is a very devoted person there who is busy digitizing virtually all the old maps and a lot of the other records. Um, mm -hmm. It's a huge amount of work and they've actually made very good progress. So that will be very good. But um, what became very apparent from hours and hours of poring over maps there is that there are still quite a large number of targets that need to be followed up um, by more modern methods of geophysics. Um, I cannot recall exactly what methods they were using um, for doing geophysics, but they did a, they did a number of geophysical um, exercises, but that's mostly in the 70s and early 80s. Basically, um, most of your exploration drilling stopped um, after the uh, mid 80s um, and there's been like plus 30 years of no modern geophysics there so um, for those of you who are more clued up in that area i appreciate what your comments are as to how to follow uh, to a follow up with more detailed geophysics more modern geophysics but one of the major things that emerges from it is that you've got to do some high risk drilling because there are so many targets. And because of the uh, quantity of magnetite associated with those mafix, you cannot easily discern whether those mafix carry any um, significant copper mineralization or, or not. Yeah, yeah, Stefan, I mean, still the best prospecting tool is a hole in the ground. Huh? John, yeah. if, if, if I could add something uh, to that, um, with the nickel sulfides, if you got fresh uh, material, especially um, gold core from geochemistry, you can actually determine a lot of the potential of what you drilled into. And uh, again, I think um, with uh, modern knowledge, uh, one can actually, without um, starting a whole new drilling campaign, have a good look at some of the existing known occurrences if you could just get all of some of the drill core. And that can add, uh, that can aid you to determine if it's a good target or not. There is Point. no drill core at all left over from the O'Keep work. Zero. Hmm. None of it was kept. Most of it was, they drilled um, AX, BX and AX, and all the core was submitted for um, assay or assay. anything that was mineralized. Hmm. And if it wasn't mineralized, it was basically dumped. Um, and um, you can't find, you can find virtually nothing, and certainly not, yeah. So <laughs> it will have, we'll have to start again when it comes to drilling. And, it, and some of those targets are quite deep, but they're very, but they're very big. Okay, and just moving on to, to onto the mineral rights ERP, I see you there. Are you, have you got any comments, ideas on how we can get these rights um, back into the public domain? Why aren't we applying use or lose it? Is the ERP there? Go on. He's just muted. ERP? No, he's there. He's just he must have muted okay. himself. Yes, John. Morning, how are you? Yeah, like a donkey. Yes, I've I've been I've been told by Lyndon about your conversation here, and as you know, I'm an attorney here in Kimberley. Yeah, and I have a number of farmers and clients that um, you know that is looking for, for for prospects in the Northern Cape, and I myself got involved um, with uh, some investors in the southern part of Namibia, and uh, th stuff that I would like. I know Gerard as well, and I will discuss that with Gerard telephonically. It's quite interesting. I've been there last week, 
And uh, from a layman's point, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting to, to, to note what we've seen there and what we were introduced right very close to the Orange River, um, just north of the Richtersfeld in that area. Um, uh, yes, so I'm, 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 I'm quite anxious to listen to what you are saying, because especially from the farmer side and the owner side in, in the Prisca area, um, I've get, I've, I'm, I'm getting some uh, questions as to who can assist them if they, if they want to look at this. Um, but I will, I will get in touch with you guys. Great. Yeah, it's good to see you. But uh, uh, if I can just um, go back to the mineral rights, Gerard, you raised the point. I mean, to, to me, there are two things. One, one, one is if you look at our mineral rights system, I mean, it does have, and Yapi can comment here, you know, it does have the, the in, in the law, you know, we have a use or lose principle. So all those big areas that have been held and effectively now sterilized, you know, should be should be reviewed on a regular basis. And if they're not being worked on, or if there's no reporting, they should be handed back into the system for other people. You know, so, so I, th I think there is, you know, that side of it. Um, I think the other side of it, sadly, is, that, and we saw that particularly in, in the sort of boom periods um, before 2008, 2009, the global financial crash, is that a lot of people in this country, um, you know, particularly sort of new entrants into into the mineral space, acquired mineral rights. Um, you know, a lot of them were, with no disrespect, um, black empowerment owners or structures. And, and those mineral rights, you know, in the good old days when you could sell almost any deposit for a, for a song and a, and a, and a profit, you, you know, that was the attitude. You had that some unsuspecting Canadian or Australian, you know, coming to South Africa, which is a jewel box, and you could make it turn on those rights. And, you know, post 2008, 2009, you know, that, that whole and, and And I think, as, as we all know, you know, in the real world, when it comes to exploration and mining, it's a long, hard slog. There's nothing easy there's nothing cheap about you know successful mineral exploration so so you know those are just two comments that i'd like to you know drop in the pond and maybe people have got some comments on that but but certainly i'm very aware of some of the the owners or the the companies that have taken out large um pieces of ground in in the northern cape and and those are still sitting there having been been sterilized yeah, John, I, I'm not sure if, if it's so much that the ground is being sterilized. I mean, also done that, taken up uh, prospecting rights on many areas, uh, not Northern Cape, but uh, you try and try and, and not much is happening due to lack of funding. So I'm not blaming them for, for I'm not blaming any, anybody for taking up ground. Uh, but maybe it's a discussion for next week's uh, meeting, is it, John? Yeah, it's well, for the, yeah. well, well for, the, for the panel discussion, be good. Yeah, yeah. But. yeah. You know, I, I, I've got some ideas why I think we're not moving forward on, on, on a lot of what we're trying to do. Uh, but uh, yes, now the area that uh, people did try in the area, but unfortunately not a lot uh, one has seen uh, coming out of it yet. Mm. Okay. Other comments, suggestions? Michael? You're very quiet there. Okay. Stephen wants to know where, where you would be looking for gold. Yeah, that's basically where. We, and, and before you guys answer, um, it's just a matter of interest, 20 kilometers north of Van Rijs, or 15 to 20 kilometers, if that, um, there are a number of cuttings through green schists. And there are some really nice quartz veins with what looks like um, anchorite or siderite and possible weathered pyrite. And uh, it kind of gets me excited thinking, oh, you've got green schist, you've got quartz veins, why not some gold? <laughs> so has anybody looked for gold in that area or is that outside of this um, terrain? And where would you look for gold in, ter in the terrains that we've discussed today? S Stephen, um, there is a gold deposit. Uh, it's in Ryan's press releases. It was discovered by Anglo-American the same group that took up uh, the old Prisco mine and uh, that a deal eventually get, got taken over by Orion, uh, Agama, Anu Homan that I mentioned at the start and his um, 
his partners. Um, they also took up that ground, did a bit of work. Ryan did more work on it, and they now applied, applied for a mining right for that gold deposit. Um, most of these VMSs, or uh, particularly Prisco mine, there is a gold component to it. Uh, a few copper districts, those deposit, uh, district, those deposits uh, also has gold. And um, the area, I'm not sure if, uh, if, if, if it's really prospective for pure gold deposits, but most of the mineral uh, deposits, they do have a, a gold uh, um, sweetener. Um, yeah. The deposit that Ryan has now applied for mining rights, uh, you can follow that or see that in the press releases. Um, that, is, that is a pure gold play, but it's, uh, the model for that is still a bit uncertain, maybe associated and later, you know, all these things, uh, VM, uh, VMS deposits do get tectonically deformed since they associate with the subduction. And the level to which they are metamorph metamorphosed just depends what happens uh, during that process and afterwards. So the gold deposit that Ryan has got um, is maybe a later, it could be a later uh, a leaching or, or, or remobilization of the gold into shear zones or whatever. I don't think we properly thought about that uh, of that region as, as a potential gold area as a lot of the carbon craton is as well. The last time we saw small gold mines on large areas, uh, many areas in the, in the Cobalt Craton was just post to Second World War. They all disappeared. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, it gets back to the point, Gerrit, that there are lots of other minerals out there that, should, that I think we should also be looking for, not just gold. I mean, when you look at the pigmentites, you know, in the Maquilan proper, and um, you know people who've who've sort of done some some sampling for for lithium minerals. I'm sure there's a you know there's a whole treasure trove that still needs to be unlocked. I mean you've concentrated on on the base metals, but and you've quietly avoided. But we'll get you to do that next time. What about all the other minerals? There's a lot of activity at the moment on those on paper yeah. types. Sort of there are quite a few and. Uh, being worked on now. Okay, and, and tell us about your carbonatites as well. What carbonatites? Well, well, your 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 um, circular intrusions. <laughs> yeah. Before we get out, Anze, just to pick up on some of the things that that uh, Kurt was talking about in terms of geochemistry and whatever to to, to sort of characterize some of these things. Something that's just being forgotten the lead isotopes and the power of lead isotopes in base metals, you know, as an exploration tool, early stage. And when you've got someone like Orion and all that fantastic core they've drilled around a keep and they've got, and the, and like keep, um, Prisca, and they've got a, a bunch of exploration projects there. And then when we were out there, I chatted to them about, it's a perfect, perfect uh, way to do lead isotopes and characterize those systems. It's not very expensive. It's not, you know, not very high tech. And once you've got an idea of, of what the isotope ratios are in some of these deposits, then when you go into exploration at an early stage, it's a very useful way of even you don't actually have to have decent like drill hole samples. If you if you get Gossens, you can come up with an optimization of prospects and things. And I think that's uh, that seems to have fallen out of favor. And I think there's a lot more we can do on things like that on these in these areas and looking for new deposits or extensions to ex ex existing deposits. So I'd actually just recommend people get out their old textbooks and read up on that. Yeah, John, yeah. I'd, just, just to lead on further from throwing it out there about a consolidating this old data so I mean, there must be a role between three or four universities and I would specifically target Rhodes, uh, Free State and Stellenbosch, for example, as a, as a triad in the region uh, with expertise to, to, to between them and the Council for Geoscience then to somehow put together the funding to put to start working on, on, a, on a sort of a step-by-step -step basis to compile or gather this information and use it as an incredible teaching training ground for young geologists. And I, I can't think of anything better than, than a young geologist being exposed to sections of drill core, going to relate it in the field and then go back to the data and start to pull together all the mini, mini stories into a bigger story. I mean, this thing is going to have to start with small steps. 
but I would suggest that that must be a way that I'm sure other people have thought of that uh, needs to be acted upon. Of course, the fundamental at all is funding for that, and then, of course, funding for students to carry on and do their little bits of work. But I think a tremendous training environment. John, and the bigger picture. John, those, those terrible three letters, CGS, I mean, part of their um, mandate is to is to uh, curate the national, you know, what all our knowledge and they throw samples away. You know, all the samples that Bruce Eglinton and I worked on, including all the zircon concentrates during our time there was thrown away, you know. And they, you know, if you go to the, the Donkok repository as well, I mean, that, an extension of that would be exactly what we talk, John's talking about, you know, curating and storing that information in a public open, you know, uh, uh, um, public domain uh, situation. And, um, you know, I think we need to start pressuring people like that to, to focus on that. It's fine to say that universities, but the universities are, you know, at the moment are really stressed for, um, for funding. And that funding is, uh, in, in research anyway, is all geared towards publications and nothing else. There's no money for this sort of stuff, you know, that said it would be difficult to, to do that in the, in the tertiary sector because there's no, you know, what turns the guys on there are publications. So, you know. No, good points. Tabedi, you got some comments there. I mean, you've been in the hot seat before. How can we get this, get this um, situation right in our country? Are you there? While we wait, uh, Michael Cronwright says there are companies looking at the pegmatites and minerals in the area, funded by Patrice Motsepe. Okay, good. Well, maybe well, we I think he, talk. he funds <laughs> part of it, part of that exploration. It's up on the border with southern Namibia. Great. So, so, so if he can, if he can own and support soccer teams, surely he can support a bit of an exploration program. Can I need to go and knock on his door. I, I have done before, John. <laughs> okay. I've, I've got scabs on my knees and my soles <laughs> are worn through. I've been everywhere. Um, every the door. mistake mm. in my life was when uh, I had three minutes in New York and uh, it ended into an hour. And finally, the guy said, I like your story. How much do you need? And I gave him a figure which was quite sufficient at that stage for getting a nice exploration thing going on the portfolio I presented, which was $5 million. Dollars. Rand. rand. Uh, no, well, rand. Today, you would, today you would Cheap. say $50 million or, or 100 But Cheap then he had a pained, pained look on his face and he said, uh, I was hoping you would say 500 because the minimum I can do is 500. In your case, I would have considered 200. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, maybe I'll do some, I'll put some of my beer money into your, your. <laughs> okay. And that was the elephant that I shot in the knee, you know, so that was, that was the lesson. And uh, one must do your own work and, and understand. But um, uh, just to add on to the data and all the draw call, um, I tried out um, to do something about the WITS exploration draw core. These, these hundreds of thousands, um, well, what was the figure now? Yeah, these, these are literally thousands of bottles. A lot of them uh, are the later um, 80s, 90s draw core, pristine, uh, typically at least 3,000 meters deep. That was the minimum, uh, the maximum depth at which you could start a new shaft in a new mine in the middle of nowhere. Uh, most of that core still exists. It's in two companies uh, ownership at the moment. And I did all round with everything I could to do something about that. Um, if you go through that data and I'm doing fingers to research again after the 80s, we couldn't publish originally, and Willem van Oesthuizen got me going in 2015, 14 on that. Unfortunately, not spending enough time on it, but we had a few papers so far. And I try and look at Fender's in the different areas where it was uh, drilled through or into. 
And uh, it, it's, it's incredible what data is out there, apart from the draw call, all the, the logs that maybe don't have a draw call anymore. And if we don't do something about that, and my idea or sort of uh, suggestion was if one can start a kind of a, a research center that's open to anybody and everyone in the world to come and do research and make it easy and cheap for uh, also the private sector uh, to access that data and, and draw core. I, I think a lot of better understanding and insight into the geology uh, of, of uh, especially the cobalt craton and it's incredible what you come across uh, when you go through that data. And I've only touched the surface of it uh, in, in a few efforts to, to, to find uh, more insight into the Fender's door. And I've, I've approached uh, different institutions and we try to get overseas uh, international funding for it and so on. But it will need the effort and it will need dedication to start something like that. The facilities are there. You could, you could put up a proper research center without having to build new buildings or put anything up. Yeah, 100%, Kurt. I mean, for that stuff to get lost would be a national calamity. You know, it's the same as I said on the Anglo data and, and it's, you know, it's, it should be a priority for all, all of us people in the minerals game, right from the CGS, the GSSA, the SAI, SAI MM, because, um, you know, with all these companies leaving, as you'll know, there are lots of big core sheds out there which should be put under lock and key before they, you know, get torn down for scrap and all that core just chucked in the backyard. Anyway. Um, yeah. Anyway, thank, thanks everyone. That's been a great discussion and thanks Gerard and well done for, for the, the, the slick presentation. Um, um, we, we, we'd certainly like, um, you know, the people and, and some of the contributions that have been put forward today and discussed to also come up in, in the panel session we want to have um, the week after next. Um, so, so for those of you who, who are not on our mailing list, please send us your, your email address. I've just put my e email address on the chat code. And Yapi, it's good to see you. So, so feel free to you know, send us your email and we'll, we'll add you to the list. And, and then already we're starting to sort of develop quite a, an interesting program, some of which will be a spin-off for, for the new year. Um, I mean, I think we all hoping that, you know, the, the lockdown situation will, will ease up, but I'm sure we're still going to find that there's, um, there's re good reason to have, you know, these Zoom presentations and, and carry on with, with what we started this year. So, so, so that's my contribution. And, and we're always looking for, for new speakers. Um, Stefan, where are you? I mean, you've obviously got insight to, into, into lots of interesting things going on out there. So we need to get you into the mix as well. Um, you just mentioned the <laughs> I, company. I have to think about it. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll think for you. We'll, we'll um, sort of encourage you. But, but you just mentioned, for example, White River Exploration. You know, who are they? We should, um, you know, try and find out a bit more about them. You probably know about them. And, and we're not trying to snoop or, you know, um, dig into the company secrets, but you know, just all part of the networking and and encouraging you know to and encouraging people to talk about exploration. You know, one one of the yeah. one of the problems I think we have is we don't have a culture of exploration in this country. And you know, why should we have when you had all bodies along hundreds of kilometres of strike? You know, when I back in my Anglo De Beers days, when I you know, talked about we need to go and explore again, I got told not to waste my time, we found everything. And I'm sure other people had the same experience. Anyway, thanks everyone. Um, any last comments, questions, Jock, John? John, I just wanna say again, uh, thanks to you and Annie for, for making this possible. Um, and uh, thank, thank you to everyone for to listening uh, at my at my uh, talk, um, final comment to Yapi. I would love to talk to him over a beer in the Star of the West in Kimberley, the oldest pub in the country. Thank you. It seems to me as if I'm sitting right on the eastern side of the Northern Cape. <laughs> <laughs>
I say if you come through, you must pay a visit. Maybe we should tapping into the farmers, you know, and get them interested in exploration, and we pass the hat around and see if we can put together a, a sort of you know Northern Cape company, which everyone's got a share in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that sounds <laughs> that sounds yeah. interesting. Yeah. So thanks, Gerard. Thanks, Seni. Once again, I see Gert. So, it's Gert, John, you know, thanks, Gert. John James, sorry. John James just wants a quick one. I yeah. just want to say thanks, Gerard. But also I wanted to say thanks to you and Henny because um, I must say that I just hope you can continue with these, uh, these Zoom meetings because they've kept me sane for the last three or four months. So, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to get down to the Cape next year. So I hope you can keep them up. No, we will. So, so, so we need your presentation as well. Huh? Uh, All your experiences. You've obviously seen some fascinating places in your career, like most of us. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I see them, but uh, I, it, the geology is not 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 so good anymore. I'm a bit like no, any. We don't. We don't. You don't have a, you know geology alone. You've you've probably got lots of good photographs. You know, we've we've had some fun sort of geological tourist talks as well. So so you know, dust out those old folders and files and old photographs that you can scan. Thank you, guys. Listen, uh, you when you receive your reminder tomorrow, there will be in the background is a map which started another conversation all by itself because I've got mm -hmm. it off Dr. Google and it actually has some mining rights on, on, on some maps there that, that people have been working on in, in the, while, while they were locked up. So have a look at that and then maybe bring that up for discussion as well. So in two mm -hmm. days time, we have another. Thank you very much for coming today. Super, thanks Annie, thanks Kat, thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you Thank very you, much. John. God bless. Thank Bye. 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 Bye.